Hello and Happy Easter. On this Easter Sunday, we tell that story of Jesus' resurrection from the Gospel of Matthew. It's a story that's full of a lot of interesting detail. First, there's those two Marys, Mary Magdalene and that other Mary, who approach the tomb at dawn to see where Jesus had been buried. Then there's an earthquake, an angelic flash of lightning, so much that the old burly guards pass out in fright, and then appears a bright, shiny, angelic messenger, all arrayed in front of an empty tomb. What's missing from this story? Obviously, the missing character is Jesus, at least at the beginning. What happened to him? He is not here, the angel says. He has been raised, whatever that might mean. But there's no triumphant explosion from the tomb, just an absence, an empty hole in the ground. Jesus is not where anyone expects him to be. And Matthew doesn't tell us how he was raised, or even quite what that means. For the rest of the story, Jesus just appears from time to time. Obviously, something happened to Jesus, but the Gospels don't tell us much about what. Just that he was raised, and he appeared. What the Gospel story does tell us a lot more about, however, is what happened to those who knew and loved him, those to whom he appeared, who experienced him alive again. In other words, whatever the resurrection was for Jesus, it was also something that happened to those who knew him. Take those two Marys. Whatever happened to those guards that made them pass out, these women did not faint. Do not be afraid, the angel told them. And the risen Jesus said the same thing, and they took it to heart. Now, I don't think their fear melted right away, but something happened in them that made it possible to recognize Jesus and then to tell his good news. Resurrection for them meant freedom from fear and the courage to tell the truth about what they had seen. A bit later in this Easter story, some time later, we hear in Acts that resurrection has done something to Peter as well. Once Peter was that disciple eager to keep Jesus in a messianic box, trying to keep him away from that cross in Jerusalem, perhaps suggesting that he was the Messiah for Jews only, Peter, though, has changed his tune. When he hears that Cornelius, a Gentile and Roman centurion, wants to be baptized, that once insular Peter can say, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to God. Resurrection for Peter meant letting go of any narrow understanding of just whom God has chosen for this Easter life. God shows no partiality, and so neither can Peter, and neither can we. I wonder if one reason the gospel stories about Jesus don't dwell too much on what happened to him, how he went from being dead to being raised, is that the story of the resurrection isn't just about Jesus at all. Resurrection may start with him, but if it ended there, we would, would that really make any difference? We would just have another demigod to worship, another Perseus, another Hercules. But if the resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of something rather than a one-off event, if it's a new spark of divine life meant to transform the world, then Easter is less about the transformation of one person than it is about the transformation of every person. After all, God shows no partiality, none, full stop. What God revealed at Easter is for everyone. This is a story about us. So how are we then to be an Easter people.
not less in this time of pandemic, of anxiety, of isolation. There are, of course, probably a thousand ways to do it, as many as there are of us. But today's stories give us at least two clues. The first, do not be afraid. Or at least do not let fear drive our response to the world. That is not to say there's something wrong with being afraid. It is a reasonable response to uncertainty, after all. But in the end, to surrender to it will not lead us to the life God wants to give. In fact, fear may get in the way of living that second mark of resurrection we hear about today. Peter's revelation that God shows no partiality. If this time of pandemic has revealed anything, it is that our world is rife with such partiality. Of unequal divisions between rich and poor, between those with jobs that can be done from home and those with jobs that require to them to go out and those with jobs that aren't essential anymore and no longer exist. There are divisions between those with good access to health care and those who do not have it, which in turn reveals the divisions that are created by our enduring and relentless divisions in our country and in our city based on color and race and class. And we haven't even begun to explore the divisions between rich countries and poor countries as this pandemic begins to migrate south, it will surely reveal that some countries are able to buy up everything they need, leaving almost nothing for a pandemic that will keep burning across the world. To live as an Easter people means not being afraid, to name such partiality as contrary to risen life. Indeed, seeking the God who offers Easter life to everyone means partnering with that God in both opposing such divisions and inequities and in joining in ways that might repair them. It means letting that spark that God lit on the first Easter to light us up as well so that others may catch the fire too. The resurrection may have started with Jesus on that first Easter, but we have yet to witness the fullness of what God will reveal through it. That fullness waits for us to take up our own part to play our own characters in this Easter story.